And good morning, I'm Phil Brink, the Consulting Coordinator of CCA's Ag Water Network. The focus of today's webinar is the Rio Grande Water Conservation District Subdistrict Number One's Water Management Plan and the system that they have created to manage the Rio Grande Aquifer more sustainably. Today's webinar includes presentations from Amber Pacheco and Marissa Fricke of the Rio Grande Water Conservation District in the San Luis Valley. We will hear details about how the 2002, 2002 and 2003 drought impacted the Rio Grande River and the responses from that and how well owners in Subdistrict 1 are adapting to aquifer reco recovery requirements. This is the seventh in a series of webinars hosted by the Ag Water Network aimed at increasing the knowledge of ag water right holders and other stakeholders in the areas of water rights, water leasing, and water management. A brief background on the Ag Water Network. We were created about three years ago by the Colorado Cattlemen's Association and Partners for Western Conservation out of concern over the increasing loss of irrigated ag land. Population growth is driving increased demand for water, and in the past, much of the demand for more water has been met by cities through the process of buying and drying uh, irrigated farmland. If this trend continues, the state water plan estimates that an additional 500 to 700,000 irrigated acres could be lost by the year 2050. So the Ag Water Network, our mission is to help keep ag water connected with ag land and provide information and technical assistance to ag producers that helps them navigate complex water laws and thrive in a time of increased water demand. Before we begin, uh, if you have any technical questions, you're having trouble getting uh, connected or having trouble seeing your screen, if you have those questions, please email those to Aaron at ColoradoCattle.org. That's E-R-I-N at ColoradoCattle.org. Or you can call the CCA office at 303-431-6422. That's 303-431-6422. If you have any questions for the presenters, in the lower right side of your screen, you should see a box and you should be able to uh, fill in your question and send that to us and we'll get to those at the end of the presentations. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on our website at agwaternetwork.org next week along with the highlights of the webinar. So our speakers are Amber Pacheco and Marissa Fricke. Amber is a program manager for the Rio Grande Water Conservation District. Her main responsibilities with the district include the formation and administration of five of the groundwater management subdistrict the district operates, and she also assists with a number of different projects they have going on. Mrs. Pacheco has been with the district for almost 14 years, and she en enjoys being involved in helping the water community find solutions to the water issues in the San Luis Valley. She holds a bachelor's uh, degree in business administration with an emphasis on accounting and an MBA in public administration from Adams State University and is a lifelong resident of the San Luis Valley. So Amber, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to you if you're ready. All right. Thank you, Phil. Sorry for that, that delay. But so I just oh, no. wanted to start out and, and, and um, give a little brief history of how we kind of got to the point where the district created these sub-districts and, and w again talking about the drought and, and kind of what what's focused our valley um, to try to come up with these more community efforts to solve our problems without having a lot of um, legislation or rules and regulations placed on us. So with the first slide, Aaron. Yep. Okay, so um, this is just a, a map of the area that we're, we're going to be talking about today. So um, in the red, you'll see the outline of the portion of the Rio Grande Basin um, that uh, falls within the state of Colorado and is considered Division Three for water resource purposes. And then it's a little harder to see, but um, there's a, a darker um, maroon line that shows the boundaries of the Rio Grande Water Conservation District. So we cover a, a big portion of, of the basin, but we do not go over the, the um, mountain range to the west, so we're not in Hinsdale County. And Costilla County that you see there to the east, they chose not to be included in the Rio Grande Water Conservation District back when we were formed. So we do include the majority of Sawatch and Mineral County, but all of Rio Grande, Alamosa, and Caneos. So 
So we got quite a large portion of the valley covered under our, under our district. Um, so the next slide, please. So here is a map of um, some of our major streams and creeks. I say major, there's much bigger around the state, but, but our big water sources here into, um, into the valley. And so we are a high mountain desert area and only receive on average about seven inches of precipitation. And most of this is coming in the form of snow on our two uh, major mountain ranges, the San Juans um, to the west and the San Grady Cristos to the east. Um, the spring runoff from these mountains is what supplies um, our irrigation water and our water that's used for a number of reasons here in the San Luis Valley. But the, the water that you see coming um, through the Rio Grande River, a large portion of that is diverted into the north side of the valley, so the area where you'll see a lot of um, sprinkler circles there. And that's what we consider here the sump area or a closed basin area. And it generally is the area that's covered by subdistrict number one, and, and Marissa will, will talk about that more. Um, but this, this area um, is recharging the unconfined aquifer system, and it is not returning into the Rio Grande River. So once it's diverted and used there, it's going down into the aquifer. So this area um, of the valley has uh, rights for recharge, where other areas with surface water um, decrees, that water returns back into the stream and goes on to the next use. Um, so the next slide, please. So here's just a map showing all the num uh, number of streams and different lakes in the area. So we are an area that doesn't have much storage. So a lot of this flows down into our aquifer systems and is used by um, the irrigators annually. A portion of it also will flow down into um, New Mexico and Texas under a Rio Grande compact requirement that the three states have. Uh, next slide. So this, we wanted to just highlight here um, the area that has been developed um, with our surface water system. So, um, the earliest recognized surface water appropriation in the valley is the San Luis People's Ditch on Calabria Creek. So that's down in San Luis, which is not part of our Rio Grande Water Conservation District. But um, shortly after that, um, uh, diversions were being made from the Caneos. And in 1866, they started making diversions and appropriations on the Rio Grande. Um, by 1889, there were over 1,200 miles of canals irrigating more than 300,000 acres um, of land here in the San Luis Valley. So it, it was developed quite quickly and they were diverting a large portion of what was running off in those different streams and creeks that we showed. Um, so this one is the Canejo system. So this is in the southern part of the district. Um, but the next slide is the Rio Grande system. And, and you can see here um, the number of miles and how far out um, we do divert the Rio Grande River and um, all of those areas that are able to receive water because of those canal systems. And so by the 1900s, a large, um, uh, the, most of our streams were already over appropriated. So early 1900, we were already um, seeing an issue here in the San Luis Valley. And this limited supply of water um, on the surface led to tensions here in the valley and also between the states here in the Rio Grande Compact was formed. So the Rio Grande Compact, when it comes in, it limits what we have in the rivers because we have a required amount and a, um, a required obligation that has to be sent down based on stream flows. So, what do we do? We start to drill wells and tap into our groundwater sources. So next slide, please. And here, here is where um, a map of the uh, permitted wells in the San Luis Valley. So this is all types of wells, any kind of use, fish, um, stock wells, domestic, commercial, um, irrigation wells. So you can see here we have over 16,000 wells. Well, those first, the first wells um, came in in the late 1800s and they actually began in the confined aquifer. 
and it was developed very rapidly and by the 1950s there was over 7,500 confined aquifer wells um, completed. The unconfined was developed a little bit more slowly um, beginning in the early 1900s but not really until 1930s did we see a rapid development in the northern side of the valley, just north of the Rio Grande. Today, um, by 1952, there was over 1,300 wells in the unconfined, and today you can see we have several times um, that. There's numerous wells, and again, highlighting these are permits. Not all of these are still um, in existence or being used. We have probably about six to 7,000 wells, I believe, that are, are being used on, in the valley today. Um, so following um, the development of those aquifers, we started to see a change in um, irrigation practices. We were a heavily flood irrigation area and we turned into a heavy sprinkler irrigation area starting in 1960s is when those sprinklers started to come in. Um, sprinklers provided the, a way for the irrigators to use both their surface water supplies early on in the season and then tapping into the ground water supplies to finish off their crops later in the season. Um, as we know here, um, I'll be talking about um, the flood of 2002, it's kind of changed the way we use that, that system of surface water first and groundwater only to finish it off. Um, so here you see the stream flow um, for the Rio Grande. This is only the Rio Grande. And if you look at um, 2002, 2003, 2004, you can see that we were well below the average. Um, in 2002, the Rio Grande was gauged at just 160,000 acre feet total. Their long-term average is 640,000 acre feet. So they had about a fourth of um, the average on that river system. And the same was true for all the systems around, uh, around the San Luis Valley. We, we were generally supplying only the most senior water rights in those years. Um, with this reduced stream flow, the irrigators here in the valley had to rely very heavily on their wells and they were withdrawing large amounts of groundwater in both the confined and the unconfined aquifers. Um, this shift to the reliance on groundwater resulted in substantial overdraft of both, of both aquifers. Next slide. And so here is, is a chart, and this, this only goes up to uh, 2010. I think Marissa will highlight a little more detail about where we are today, but this is what we were seeing um, when the district was starting to think about what to do with the drought situation and trying to figure out a way to come back into balance. And you can see in those years 2002 to 2005 the drastic decline that we had. And this is just the unconfined aquifer. So we lost nearly a million acre feet in those couple of years because of the reduced stream flow and that heavy reliance on groundwater. Um, because of this, we could start to see as a district that um, the community depended on these aquifers if we were to keep our agricultural community whole. Um, so with both the decline of surface water and groundwater, along with what we saw happen up in the South Platte area in 1999, that was a motivating factor for our district and this community to start to find a way um, collectively to try to figure out how to solve our problems. Um, so in uh, 2004, there was legislation um, passed because that with the drought, there was, um, there was a recognition that groundwater withdrawals was impacting surface water rights that were senior um, to those groundwater rights. So Senate Bill 222 um, was passed in 2004, and that bill here in the Valley, at least we summarize it to say, it gives the state engineer the ability to adopt rules and regulations for groundwater withdrawals and that those groundwater withdrawals can continue so long as um, we prevent any material injury to senior surface water rights and we have the ability to create and maintain sustainable aquifers with those groundwater withdrawals occurring. So in that bill, it highlighted that the state engineer could allow um, the creation of groundwater management subdistricts as, as an, um, an option 
other than expensive um, augmentation plans that each individual water right owner would have to seek to meet these rules. And so it allowed this community type effort to go out and um, meet these rules as they were coming forth. So um, this map here that you see on your screen um, came about with this whole effort to try to identify um, what depletions were occurring and um, what areas they were occurring in. So these are what we call the response areas, um, and all of these were created by the state in their groundwater modeling effort. Um, the Rio Grande Water Conservation District um, went into these areas, and that's how we set up our subdistricts, as we followed um, these boundaries set up by the state. And the way the state set them up was um, areas of similar community interest, well types, and surface water sources. So confined wells are in confined areas. Unconfined mainly sit in the um, subdistrict one area. Um, confined aquifer wells, you know, up in the north. So we tried to follow what the state did because they were able to model individual areas of impact and also um, sustainable aquifer requirements. So since, um, uh, since I've been here at least, which was back in 2005, we have been working as a district to form these subdistricts. Um, of course, subdistrict one is the largest subdistrict it came on first, and they've been operating for a number of years, but most recently, um, five additional subdistricts around the valley have been um, completed and have been through the court system and are approved. Two of those additional subdistricts, one um, just within a couple miles of the Rio Grande is the Rio Grande Alluvial Subdistrict or Subdistrict 2, and then a third one down in the Caneos area was formed as Subdistrict 3. Both of those subdistricts have just now completed plans of water management, and they will be moving in next year to a situation like Subdistrict 1 where we'll begin making replacements and working on aquifer conditions for those for those areas. Marissa is uh, the program manager for subdistrict number one uh, at the Rio Grande Water Conservation District, and she manages river depletions owed for delivery to the compact. She monitors and tracks water levels and volumes in the unconfined aquifer as well. Uh, she also promotes water conservation by working with her board and subdistrict number one constituents on following programs. And she is a Valley native and grew up on a sm small farm near Alamosa, Colorado. So with that, uh, Marissa, uh, if you're ready, we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the portion I'll be doing is focusing on so District 1 and our efforts, um, like you mentioned, that we're, we're trying to focus on as far as recovering the aquifer. Uh, next slide, please. So as Amber showed um, earlier with the maps of the different subdistricts, uh, this map here really focuses on um, subdistrict one, kind of the, the area that, um, if, if you want to say, kind of got a pen drawn around it on all those different irrigation uh, parcels. That's what makes up subdistrict one. Um, and I listed just what some of our main crops that we grow in that area, um, just for kind of a, a base layer information to, to start off my presentation. So as you can see, potatoes is um, our highest crop that we grow in this area, followed by grain, alfalfa, and then canola. And we have a lot of different varieties of, of crops that we grow as well, but I just wanted to highlight the, the top four. Next slide. Thank you. So um, in 2002, as we've mentioned, that was the multi-year drought that really changed the, the game here for all of us. And that's when the river was down, the aquifer plummeted. Uh, we just couldn't um, keep moving forward as business as usual, as I like to say, um, because the, 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 the situation had changed. So um, farmers wanted to to realize that um, something needed to, to be in place to help us continue to do agriculture in this valley, uh, have the crops, have the farms, but also 
be able to uh, monitor the aquifer and, and not over, um, overdo our pumping to where it wouldn't be able to be recovered. So uh, they decided to put a tax on themselves to say whatever we pump, we will owe um, in a certain dollar amount tied to what we will eventually talk about later on, but is the variable fee that is charged um, based on acre foot uh, usage. So in 2006 is when Subdistrict 1 was legally recognized and um, we moved forward to put into place regulations that the state approved um, to be operational um, for our, our wells as well as uh, work on our sustainability. Next slide. So here is the um, clearly identified requirements that Subdistrict 1 has to meet. Uh, this is what was uh, approved at the state level. Um, we have 20 years to get the unconfined aquifer storage level at levels between 200,000 and 400,000 acre feet. Um, so we have about 12 years remaining, and I listed the benchmarks that are outlined for us, and this acre feet is based off of consumptive use. I wanted to highlight that. Um, I put a red check mark next to uh, that first benchmark that we've met. It, it is a little bit uh, debatable because this is, uh, we have reached this temporarily. Um, it's something to where if someone wants to put their end gun back on, if um, other variables have changed, we may be at that level still, we may not be. So um, I, I cautiously celebrate the first benchmark that has been met, but understand that things can always change, so we always have to move forward with the understanding that um, we need to do more. Next slide. So with uh, those benchmarks listed, uh, we needed to have measuring devices in place to uh, report to the state, to report to all the farmers in Subdistrict 1 that will be paying these fees, uh, how are we going to help monitor this. And so we have uh, engineers that go out and they test, uh, we have 27 uh, test wells in the unconfined aquifer, and we have a Subdistrict staff employee that goes in and tests them as well. And through his measuring efforts and our engineer, we do monthly reporting on the aquifer level. Um, so during the irrigation season, not in the irrigation season, everyone knows what is happening um, underneath us. We also have to report to the state with an annual report and an annual, annual replacement plan, which basically outlines what um, we owe to the river, uh, service water withdrawals, uh, crops we plan on using, um, just basically, like it kind of says, our, our plan on the, the year coming forward, as well as what we did in the, the prior year, as far as how much did withdrawals do we did, sprinkler flood, irrigation, um, we track all of that and report to that to the state. And we also, um, part of our decree, we have to do an annual hydraulic divide study. So those are the measuring tools we have in place. So this is the graph you saw earlier, um, just with a little bit more information. Uh, so you see on that negative 400,000 acre feet level, I put that red bar line across so that anyone reading this map knows where we have to recover the aquifer um, within 12 years. So uh, that January 19, um, you see they are listed at the bottom right corner. That shows what we have done this year. And we have 12 years remaining, so you can see we have quite a steep climb to get there, but um, we'll continue being optimistic. But this is, this is the facts, and this is um, the graph that shows kind of where the hole we need to dig out from. Okay, next slide. And this is just a, a different way to, to show that graph. Um, so you can see in 2015, 2016, and 2017, we had positive gains in the unconfined aquifer. But then this year alone, you see how much the aquifer has, 
has declined um, because of the many variables, but most importantly was the, the lack of snow we received last year uh, really had this impact, as you can see, on our aquifers. So um, if you go to the next slide, how I phrase it to people is what we've gained in three years in aquifer storage, we lost in one year. Okay, next slide, please. So with um, the mindset that we're all in this together, that's how the subdistricts uh, are, are formed and created and that's what our motive is, uh, what can we do moving forward? We have data, uh, which falls under our research. We need more collaboration, which um, requires us more input, uh, participation, ideas, and then how can we fund these goals? It's kind of the three main categories that you can say drives subdistricts in, in their action plan, if you will. Okay. And then you can go ahead and advance so that all of them pop up. There you go. Perfect. There you go. Okay, so with our benchmarks um, outlined by the state, the data that we collect, we then roll up those two pieces of information into what, what can we do? How can, with the benchmarks and the data, what can we roll out um, to help this, this goal of ours? And so we started with the CREP program, which is the Conservation Reserve Enhancement Program which we partnered with the USDA and FSA on this, and it is linked to the uh, Farm Bill. So in this instance, it was the 2014 Farm Bill. As we all know, the Farm Bill is um, currently being revised or, or in the, the steps to get revised or passed. Um, and so we are still offering the CREP program, but until this new Farm Bill is passed, we are on a temporary hold. But um, that is our biggest program we have, zero water usage, um, and we have those three scenarios that you can see um, for different producers if they don't want to do the, the CREP program. We also have a program, RCPP, which is tied in with NRCS, and what this is is basically um, farmers can go into NRCS office let them know they want to, they're interested in more options of water saving. They go out and consult with them on their field, look at what practice might be best, whether it's a cover crop, moisture sensors, um, looking at, you know, rebowling sprinklers, whatever the case is, um, they make more of a customized practice uh, on these fields, and then the subdistrict does a dollar for dollar match on that program. Then, of course, we also offer workshops just to educate everyone on all these different graphs, all the different data we collect and program. We're also working towards, uh, I guess it's um, experiments on recharge ponds within the properties that Subdistrict 1 has purchased. How can we get, um, what's the best shape of a recharge pond, the soils, how do soils interact, um, so this is very new, uh, so I, I don't have much to say on that, but we're rolling it out for 2019 on just more research on um, how we can maximize the most when we have good high water years, because we, we understand that we're not always going to be in a drought, um, so when we do have an abundance of hopefully snow and rain, how can we make sure we're utilizing that as well? So kind of looking on both ends of the spectrum there, not only drought years, but looking on good water years, how can we maximize that? Okay, you can go to the next one. As well as um, land purchases there was the last one. So this goes into CREP just a little bit more. Um, what is CREP and what is the goals? And you can see there are a lot of goals outlined for um, the CREP program. Obviously the number one we are focused on is the water reduction. Uh, it, this is a 15-year program, so people who enroll in CREP have the option of 15 years having their, their land set aside um, temporary, is what we call it, or 15 years permanent. And the difference between 
Um, the two is that in 15 years, if you chose the temporary option, your build can go back into full production, if you will, um, after those 15 years. If you do the 15-year permanent, your water rights are actually retired at the state, and um, that well that was tied into the contract would not go into production again. So it is a 15-year a program with the option of temporary versus permanent. And you can see that there's a lot of great benefits that come from enrolling in the program and what it does with soil and wildlife and pesticides and different vegetations that can grow on there. Um, we, we definitely know that this program is long-term, very uh, substantial, I guess, if you want to say that, in terms of water savings. And it comes with um, payments to the producer to help them as well, um, since they're no longer going to be farming this piece of land. This chart just shows uh, the enrollment of acres, again, is branched out between the permanent and temporary that I explained earlier, and then just how many acres we have total enrolled into the CREP program, which is the 8,683. And this just shows uh, what temporary and permanent enrollment looked like broken out by year. and then by county. So a little bit more about the CREP um, funding. That, uh, that program has several payments that we give to the farmer. Uh, some of them that are listed within the actual CREP uh, contract is the annual rental rate. It could be from 22 up to 62, just depending on where you live. And then the subdistrict number one also kind of padded that, if you will, by adding on some sign-on bonuses that range from 1,000 to 1,750. And there's some other incentives as well, just kind of depending on your situation, your land, your location, if you're bringing in surface water to the contract, there are additional uh, incentives that we, we fund. Then our fallow program that uh, we just rolled out is $200 an acre, and then the RCP program that is a dollar for dollar match on the water savings practice that you selected. So in order to have individuals set out land, um, if it's not voluntarily, obviously we do, uh, we have to incentivize them and that comes in the form of, um, you know, whether it's the CREP payments or fellow payments or matching the RCPP funding, we do that through what we call the variable fee. The variable fee is what we charge for the water usage that um, was explained in the very beginning of this presentation as what we, the farmers who decided we were going to tax ourselves so we can kind of control the situation. Um, so the variable fee is driven um, by the budget, which is driven by sustainability, which rolls back to the aquifer level. So uh, the variable fee is used for purchasing and storing water to, to replace our live depletions, as well as the conservation programs that we roll out. So for 2019, uh, with that steep decline in the aquifer, we are really trying to hone in on what is going to make the most impact uh, for the aquifer ultimately, but considering farmers, um, the, the payments, the, the snowpack, the, the budget, everything that goes into considering these programs, what can we do? Um, so for 2019, we are really looking at what is um, the best program that we need to focus on, how we educate people, as well as uh, making sure we have the necessary funds to, to have these programs successful and appealing to a farmer. You know, our goal is within reach, but um, at a very aggressive pace. Um, and you can go to the next slide.
Okay. So, uh, as you saw this graph earlier, just understanding that we have a lot of variables that are kind of out of our hands, out of our control, um, focusing in on we're just not kind of our new normal is, is very different than um, what was in the past. And so I just highlighted how it's been a decade since the river has been at that 700 uh, acre feet level. So what can we do? Uh, we are really just focusing on what we do know. Um, we have irrigation records, pumping history, aquifer numbers, so we need to focus on what we do have and, and rearrange our, our goals and purposes to make sure we ultimately hit that um, outlined goal that the state has set for us. So that was the end of my presentation there. Um, and I'll lend it back to you for um, the closing part yeah. of this webinar. Great. Um, well, that, uh, yeah, you covered a lot of ground there. That was great, Marissa. I wondered on the fallow program, you said it was for $200 per acre. Uh, is that, that's per year? And is that for, for multiple year sign up or is that just year to year sign up? That's year to year. Um, that's the payment they'll get every year. And are they responsible then for controlling weeds? Do they need to plant a cover crop or, or how does it work on the farmer's end? Sure. So we have them, uh, whatever they had this summer, to leave that, you know, in basically um, so that they have either stubble or whatnot. If they didn't, um, if they did, let's say, till it all under, um, we would ask that they have some sort of cover established going into that. Mm -hmm. So the farmer recognizes it's, it's going to cost them a little bit of money. Um, it's not just pure profit of that $200 per acre. They'll, they'll need to control weeds and, and maybe establish a, a cover crop as well if they, for whatever reason, had a cleared field. Right, right, yep. Um, so it's, it's definitely a, a managing um, idea of what is gonna work for everyone involved, but that's right, it's, it is something to hold on to those soils. Um, on the CREP rental, the CREP rentals, um, you had, I think, four different payment levels. I was just curious if you could uh, expand on that a little bit. I wasn't quite sure, and you, you mentioned the sign-up bonus as well, um, why the different rates and what those rates were attached to in terms of uh, farmer performance, I guess, on the land. Sure. Um, so the, the smaller payments, the $22 one, that was probably in our temporary category. Uh, so, with the, the goal to retire, um, what is it, 80, 40,000 acres uh, of permanent dry up, uh, the board decided to do the, the smaller payments towards temporary, but that $22 one um, would be temporary contract probably without surface water. Um, and then as the increments go up, it's probably more to, geared towards where the land is. There's an area close to the, um, I know, the, land, the hydraulic divide that we call the focus area, and they get higher rental rate payments. Um, and typically, land in that area also bring in surface water to the contracts. So um, payments depend on location, water that's tied into the contract, and, and acres. So one thing I was curious about, uh, and as you kind of walked us through the usage uh, historically in the valley and, and moving from all surface and then over to, in many cases, wells, um, for those folks who converted over to wells and had a surface water right then, is their well right tied to the priority date of their surface water right? Uh, no, um, the well right has its own appro appropriation date, so they are de definitely going to be junior to the to the surface water right. Mm -hmm. And I imagine those folks that happen to have really senior surface water rights can use those to augment their own wells. Then um, does, does um, it work that way in some cases, or no? So you so um, the way the system um, was set up to work is for them to use those senior surface work rights for as long as they have them, and then wells would only be a supplement to those senior rights. Um, but 
as, as we've seen in the case here, um, it's gotten uh, harder and harder, runoff comes faster, so they've generally gone to wells and in some areas can recharge all their surface water. So in Subdistrict 1, a number of the bigger canal systems, they'll still divert all their surface water, but generally the majority of them recharge it into the aquifer and then pump it out through their wells. Not all, not all subdistrict members have surface water, but, um, but for augmentation purposes, if you have a well and there's an injury to the stream, um, you would have to go to court and change your surface water right to an augmentation use before you could just use it as a direct augmentation to your well. Okay. I, um, and then I also wanted to ask on the variable fee, um, is the variable fee based on a tiered rate structure uh, in terms of, you know, no. a lot of units, uh, or is it just kind of straight uh, how much you use and you pay a per, per acre foot? Sure. So it is not on a tiered. Um, it is tied to irrigation wells only. So um, we are going to have more wells come online with the new groundwater rules um, that are maybe humidifiers or um, and smaller wells, and they will have a different rate that they will pay. But if you are an irrigation well, is that if that's how um, what your decree says, you do pay this one flat rate of the variable fee that that we have set. Okay. Well, I don't think we had any audience questions, so uh, I want to say a real special thanks to our speakers today and for your patience for our technical issues that we had. Uh, Amber and Marissa, and for sharing the insights that you did uh, about your project. It was very interesting. And as I mentioned, um, we're going to, uh, we'll edit this and then and have the webinar posted probably next week. Uh, and uh, we'll have a highlights document that will accompany that so people can go back and look at that at their leisure. Once again, thank you uh, for your participation and for those you. great presentations. And uh, this concludes today's webinar.